It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the Dartmouth head swimming and diving coach, Coach Jesse Moore. How are you doing today? Doing well, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get started in college coaching? So I actually kind of fell into it. Um, my my path was a little circuitous in terms of, um, you know, I swam in college, obviously, so I had division one college ex- collegiate experience, right. With swimming. And, um, I was majoring in neuroscience as an undergrad and I was looking into kind of healthcare and, um, you know, business pathways after, after college. And I went to Drexel and I got my master's in public health there. But when I first got accepted to their program and decided to go there, um, I reached out to, um, an administrator there who I knew through the student athletic advisory council through our conference, because I was the conference rep for William and Mary. And she actually offered me a graduate assistant position in academic advising. So I was working in the athletic department as an academic advisor for student athletes from a whole bunch of different teams, having a great time. And then when the swimming coaches realized I was there and they had swum against me, um, you know, they had, they only had two swimming coaches for a, a co-ed team. Um, they asked if I would be interested in, in volunteering with them. And so I started coaching with them, um, you know, five or six days a week and on top of my GA position and I loved it. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was, I realized my path and I went forward in the direction of coaching, but it was by accident completely. What was your college experience like? playing for William and Mary? I had an unbelievable experience. Um, You know, I had two different head coaches while I was there. I had McGee Moody for three years uh, up until my senior year. And then Matt Crispino, who was also an alum of the college. um, I had him as a coach my senior year. And, you know, I made my lifelong best friends at that school. Um, You know, my, my core, um, you know, group of friends that I hang out with and talk to and whatnot, even though we live all over the country. um, You know, we, we are very much still a close knit group, but I had a great experience, a lot of funny memories, um, a lot of challenging memories too, that were just like instrumental in my growth as a, as a student athlete and as a person. Um, But I had a tremendous undergraduate experience, educationally, athletically, um, relationships, all of that. I, I just couldn't say enough good about, about, and Mary. What was it like, obviously, coming out of college, going into your alma mater, coaching as the assistant coach? So um, I started coaching. I was gone for two years um, while I was in grad school and coaching at Drexel. And, and so same conference. So I was coaching against William and Mary, and I got to see some of my old teammates, um, you know, competing at our conference championship or at a dual meet, right? Um, when I went back, um, the, when I was a senior in college, the current freshmen were now seniors at William and Mary. So talk about kind of an interesting, you know, relationship shift for them, right? I go from being their friend to their coach. Um, my biggest fear was that they wouldn't take me seriously. Um, I drew a very, very hard line in week one. Um, you know, they tested that boundary and I drew a very hard line in week one. Um, and they never tried to cross that boundary again. So they definitely looked at me as a coach. They had no other option, but to, um, and, uh, I had a great time. I mean, you know, like I said, Matt Crispino was my my head coach my senior year of college, and I got to work for him. Um, and he was so instrumental in my development as a coach, um, giving me my first full-time job opportunity to get into the business. Um, 
you know, it was definitely a, a phenomenal experience. And while I was coaching there, I became really good friends with a group of people who were also alums around my age that I knew from different sports, all working in the athletic department. So really got to develop some cool relationships um, beyond uh, my collegiate relationships too. And, and so that was pretty fun. Um, and I learned a lot while I was there and I had a lot of opportunities to learn and grow. And Matt gave me a lot of freedom in my, my young coaching career, um, you know, gave me my own training group. I got to coach and, you know, didn't have to get permission or answer to him about anything. I just got to run the group and have that experience. So I learned quite a bit from trial and error and having conversations and a lot of instinct. Um, you know, I didn't have the science side down of coaching, but a lot of art and instinct in my coaching at that time. Now it's more of a combination of, of instinct, art and science. What was it like, obviously, joining the Duke program to become the assistant coach, leaving your alma mater to finally put that chapter aside? So I almost didn't do it. <laughs> I almost didn't go. Um, I remember getting the offer and I was so excited because Duke is amazing, right? Like what a great opportunity to, to coach at, at that university. Um, I remember sitting in Matt's office, uh, my boss at William & Mary, and I just started to cry. And I think it's the first time he ever saw me cry. <laughs> and and um, I just was like, I don't know if I can leave this team. I just love these kids. And you know, and, and he's like, well, what are you going to, like, what are you going to do? And I said, I just don't know. I don't know. I had 48 hours to make a decision. And I went and sat in the head women's basketball coach's office at the time. Her name is um, Debbie. And, and I sat in her office and um, I just started to like ball. I, you know, and she gave me some of the best advice in my career um, in regards to my own development as a really young assistant coach. And she said, those kids will always grow up. They will always graduate you know, and so at some point they will leave. So if you don't look out for yourself and your career and your development, nobody else will, you know? So she, she didn't tell me what to do, but she gave me some really great advice, which led me to take the step out of the nest. And I went to Duke and uh, started coaching in the ACC for Dan Colella, who was, who is, and is still the head coach there and uh, amazing man and a mentor and friend and father figure all at the same time. I was there for four years and had a really tremendous experience working with some of the best coaches in the country and a bunch of different sports, um, you know, being in an athletic department that was winning a ton of ACC championships. And, um, you know, I think every year I was there, our athletic department ranked in the top 10 of the director's cup. So you could go to any sporting event and watch world-class athletics occur. And it was so fun. I learned a lot, you know, I mean, there were so many opportunities for growth as a coach there, um, and professional development as a coach there. Um, you know, working with um, Greg Dale, who was our sports psychologist, um, and he's still at Duke now. And, you know, reading his books and learning from him and having my own one-on-one -on -one sessions as a coach to be a better coach, like just all the things that that athletic department offered were so fun. I just had an amazing experience there. Um, and that truly was, you know, this huge growth opportunity for me as well. Um, and all the connections I made and the people, I mean, gosh, I still talk to so many of my swimmers from that program and so many of the alums who I never coached, but got to know as alumni. And I just have, and will always feel very connected to that program. And that program, it almost felt like my own alma mater. I loved being there. What was it like, obviously going to a big power five school like Duke and becoming the recruitment coordinator? So the pressure on recruiting increased, right? I mean, um, Competing in the ACC versus the CAA was very different. So, um, you know, it's like you experience so many things like imposter syndrome, right? Like, am I good enough? Am I all these things, right? And, you know, I just, I did everything I could. I worked my butt off. I worked so many late nights. I did not sleep enough. I did not take care of myself enough. Um, but I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot on the fly. I learned a lot from Dan and my other colleagues on the staff. And I busted my butt in recruiting. And, and that's actually the program where I really was able to build a name for myself as a, as a strong recruiter around the country. Um, my recruiting there ended up being kind of what moved me forward in my career. Obviously, the, the student athletes I coached um, achieved a lot and did a lot of great things. 
Um, but I became known as a recruiter big time. And so I was really lucky at the opportunity and the development that Dan provided um, because that launched my career going forward, really, you know, um, but the pressure was there, you know, when you're at a place like Duke and you see all these great teams achieving and performing at a high level, it, it, it's like that, that saying that, that, that goes around, like you become like the five people you spend the most time with. Right. And so all of a sudden it's, you're just because of the nature of the place you're in, you just elevate your game. Everything becomes bigger and better. You know, you have no choice to, or you're going to feel like such a failure and you're going to get swallowed up in that. So <laughs> what were some of your roles as obviously the director of recruiting at a power five school? So, um, you know, that, that was really, like I came in as an assistant coach who was in charge of recruiting and that title really was given to me as um, a promotion. Right. Um, and um, my role never really changed. And uh, in the four years I was there, but um, you know, I was in charge from a recruiting standpoint, I managed our recruiting database. Um, you know, in addition to all the coaching things, right. I managed a recruiting database. I, um, created all of our call lists for the coaching staff, um, organized who they were communicating with, um, how we were approaching student athletes, um, snail mail, and all of the kind of visual uh, recruiting attractions that you can send and provide people, um, graphics that we would text to them or post on social media, um, you know, home visits. I did a ton of those club visits, our staff, you know, I would coordinate and tell our staff who that they were going to do club visits for and home visits for. I would do a ton of those. So I um, traveled across the country all the time doing club visits and home visits, which was super exciting. Um, but yeah, my role really involved around anything with recruiting, unofficial visits with recruits and getting the team organized, um, whether it was lunch on campus and campus tours and meetings with, um, you know, the different resources we have in athletics, like our sports psychologist or our student athletics development staff or career services or going into the Duke Athletics Hall of Fame or, you know, touring campus and all of those different aspects, right? And um, and then going through admissions pre-reads. I got to work directly with admissions and go through admissions pre-reads with our student athletes and our recruits and see what that looked like at the end because that was part of the narrowing down process, right? Who can get approved by admissions and who can't? Um, and so I got to experience a lot of different parts of the recruiting process, oh, including financial aid too. I was in charge of doing all the financial aid pre-reads for our student athletes. Um, so I got to really experience a lot of different things across campus, a lot of different roles across campus and connect with a lot of different people and partner with different people within the university as a whole outside of athletics, just because of the nature of the job. Um, you know, so that was a really cool and fun and interesting part of recruiting that that um, was part of my wheelhouse. What was it like for you, obviously, leaving the state of North Carolina to go to Minna, Northern, Northeastern, obviously, after Northwestern, yeah. What was that like for you going out of the state of North Carolina to Northwestern? Yeah, so going up to Chicago, um, I kind of adapted to the southern weather, <laughs> and so my blood was a little thin, so my first October in Chicago felt really cold, um, but no, I mean, it was interesting because that was my first program where I was with a single gender team. Um, there is a men's and a women's team, but I coached only the women's team at Northwestern. We were split. Um, I worked for somebody. I um, I'm still so close with today, Abby Steckety. And um, I felt so incredibly lucky to work for her. Um, you know, I went to Northwestern. Uh, I tried to go to Northwestern as the head coach and I had phone interviewed there and everything. Unfortunately, I didn't make the final cut. And I, I was also young and not as experienced. Um, but at 29 at the time, it was great to get the, the interview for the head coaching job. Um, but I got to work for Abby there. And I will tell you, I don't know that two people have ever been as in sync as the two of us were with working together. And I thought that I worked hard and she made me raise my game. I didn't know I could be better. And, you know, and I, I think that I provided her a lot of support that she needed. And I think we just really collaborated well in areas that we were both strong and not as strong in. And I think that we were able to really lift each other up. And it was a pretty transformative experience for me. I will tell you, you know, we were brought there to, to restore that women's team to the prominence that it should and had been in the past. You know, I think the 
almost a decade maybe um, since we had been there, uh, or not since we had been there, but before we were there, um, I don't think their women were ranked in the top 25 at NCAAs. And, you know, previously when Kathy Wickstrand was coaching that women's team, they had been in the top 10. Um, so we really uh, took that program, we gave them a sharp turn and, you know, in our first year together, we, we were ranked 21st in the country and, um, you know, had individual all Americans and, and really recruited at a high level. I mean, that, that women's team over the last couple of years has performed extremely well. Um, you know, and a lot of the women that are performing for them are recruits that Abby and I, uh, had recruited together and, you know, uh, Abby and I haven't worked together in gosh, almost, three and a half years. Um, but we talk a lot or text a lot. Um, you know, when I made the decision to come to Dartmouth, I called her and consulted with her and gosh, we talked about everything. And she was just such an amazing mentor for me. Um, but the experience I had at Northwestern, I think was, that was the first time where I really felt like I was ready to be a head coach. Um, and I learned so much while I was there and Abby helped me think about things that I didn't normally think about, right? Like we all have blind spots. And so she helped me grow so much. Um, and I think she and I helped each other grow a lot too and help support each other in ways that, that we could because of our strengths and our weaknesses. What was it like for you obviously to go to Minnesota to become the associate head coach? So when I left Northwestern and went to Minnesota, I was um, really excited to join that program. Um, Minnesota is known for developing over a long span of time for developing student athletes um, who you've never heard of at all in the recruiting process. No name people, you just have no idea who they are and developing them into household names and all Americans. And so I was really excited that Kelly and Terry gave me an opportunity to work for them. And so I got to learn so much from them and from when Alicia was on our staff, Maddie uh, Olson and, you know, Maddie Olson's still there coaching, Jeff Kostoff, who came in after me, but is still there coaching. Um, I got to learn so much from all of them and had a tremendous experience. I mean, I went to a wedding in, in Minneapolis, October 2nd, you know, a couple, like a month ago, um, and met up with them and got to see everybody and get breakfast or dinner or something. And so that was really great. But, um, I learned a lot about developing, I think like, I'm a very fast paced person and, and Kelly, my boss helped me kind of sit back a little bit more and reflect on things that I didn't always think about. Cause I'm a like, go, go, go fast paced person. Um, I act quickly and, um, you know, he really helped kind of pull me back a little bit and help me like really think and reframe things, which is a really vital skill in this industry, especially working with so many different types of student athletes. Um, so I just felt so lucky to have the opportunities I had and the opportunity in Minnesota was no different. I had an amazing time. What was it like for you to obviously get the first head coaching job in your career at Dartmouth? So yeah, when I was offered the job, Joanne and Peter, um, Peter's our athletic director and Joanne's our senior associate athletic director, when they offered me the position, um, you know, all of our interviews were through Zoom and um, they asked if I needed to come to campus. I had actually already been because I was a finalist for the head coaching job in 2016, but I didn't get the job. Um, and I accepted the job on the spot. I, I didn't need to go, I've been there. So I was just so honored and excited. Um, I will tell you, I felt so many different emotions. Um, you know, I'd spent my whole career working to become a head coach. And once I said yes, I felt the weight on my chest all of a sudden, like I felt the pressure all of a sudden. And I'm thinking to myself like, oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> but um, I felt so many emotions. And especially in my first few months, I was thrilled and psyched out of my mind. I was terrified. I was anxious. I was stressed. I was super charged. I was like hungry to work. I was like all the different emotions you can experience. I was experiencing at the same time for a good few months until I really felt like I was able to kind of stand on my own two feet, um, which really didn't happen until I hired my staff and had some support not working alone for a while. So, um, you know, and now I've been here, um, gosh, almost seven months. 
Of course, once you took the job at Darkmouth and started hiring staff, what was that feeling like of now you're the one that's in charge and you're the one in the hot in the front seat and stuff like that? Well, you almost said hot seat, and that could be true. I could be in the hot seat, right? I mean, <laughs> the, head co- every, the, box, the buck stops with the head coach, right? Um, but uh, no, it was cool. I, I had a very, um, through my experiences coaching, I had a pretty good idea of, of the behavior type of people that I wanted on my staff. I, I'm pretty self-aware, um, usually, right? Um, again, we all have blind spots, but I'm pretty self-aware at this point now. And I had said throughout the whole process of hiring that I'm looking for people who are different than me. Um, because if I hire people like me, um, it's not going to be good for the team. We need different people, different behavior types. Um, and so that was a really big part of my, um, hiring process that I talked to all the candidates about. Um, it was extremely interesting for me to hire. Um, you know, I had been involved in searches before, but as an assistant, not like the one making the final decision, though I've always felt like I had a lot of say in who we hired. Um, and fortunately, I was able to, I offered the job um, to two people after they interviewed and they both said yes. So I was really lucky on that, uh, that account, right? That front. Um, but I felt like there's almost like a paternal feeling, like I feel responsible for them. Um, and yeah, it was, it was pretty cool to hire a staff. I mean, it was just really neat. You know, I, I've always wanted to be able to do that. I just didn't know what that was going to be like as the head coach who makes the final decision. So what was it like for you, obviously being able to now create your own program for a college program and build it the way you want versus obviously going ways other head coaches want? So, you know, it's so interesting because with that question, right? Like, I have ideas, right? I mean, we all learn from, from different coaches we work with and work for, um, you know, and we all learn from, from each other, um, things we want to do and things we don't want to do. Um, just like people I've worked with probably think, you know, there's things they want to emulate from me and there's things they don't want to emulate from me. Right. Um, and so when you're incorporating a, a, you know, a change with a whole staff, right. I mean, we had a brand new staff taking over, you know, a program that was just reinstated, um, you know, they, in the middle of a pandemic on top of it, I mean, like change and adversity is like the highlight of this experience for the, for our student athletes. Right. And, um, it was pretty exciting and taxing all at the same time. Um, you know, and I didn't know what that culture would be like at this point. Right. And then we've had two competitions now this past weekend and the weekend before. And I think the culture that we have worked really hard to establish and that our team has really worked hard to embrace um, really showed and and showed through our competition. Um, And I'm not even talking about just performance, though they performed super well at the the last two weekends. Um, But I'm referring to even how they carried themselves on deck, how they... Uh, how they were behaviorally as a team, how they, I mean, they, they took every piece of advice we gave them, all of our, all of our cumulative knowledge as coaches and, and they took it and they ran with it and they exceeded our expectations more than you could imagine. So to see that occur and to see them perform well at the same time, um, that was really emotional. Like that was cool. Um, you know, and, and, gosh, our, like our men's team, for example, hadn't won an Ivy league competition against any team it since like 2014. So we just broke a, you know, a six year dry streak and to see the emotion on their faces from that. I mean, people were emotional from that. And, you know, I talked to some of our, our men after that, right after that competition. And I didn't even know that it had been that long. I just assumed that they won something, you know, but they've gone through therefore like our seniors have gone through four years and never beat an Ivy league opponent. And, and it, you know, after, you know, after being reinstated and having a COVID year and no athletics last year and coming back and just crushing it was really special and rewarding. Right. And so all of that was kind of a cumulative visual of what the culture we're hoping to build is like, and I hope it only continues to be enhanced and I hope it only continues to move forward that way. Um, because 
the way that our team was, I was so proud as a head coach. And I think that at both competitions, they were both tri meets. We were the best team on deck at both meets. Like no coach could hold a candle to that. Like nobody could tell me otherwise we were the best team on deck. Um, and I was just really proud of the performances that they gave. What has it been like, obviously coming off of COVID where obviously you didn't have any meets and obviously you didn't have anything under your belt as head coach. And now this year is your first true year as head coach and have meets. Well, and last year I was still at Minnesota and I got to compete. So we still competed in the big 10 and we still went to NCAAs and all of that. And then when I came here, their restrictions um, at Dartmouth were still pretty heavy. Um, so it was just very, it was like, I traveled back in time, you know, to like stay at home orders. I just felt like super restricted when I got here, just based on the Dartmouth protocol with everything. Right. So, um, that was sort of depressing for me as a coach, <laughs> you know, we could only have one, one student athlete in a lane. Um, they had to be at opposite ends. So, you know, somebody's on the same end in lanes one, three, five, and seven, and somebody's on the other end in two, four, six, and eight. Right. Um, and it just didn't feel very, um, team oriented or team like, right. Like there was no energy to that, that form of training. And, and so coming out of the pandemic, I remember when summer session started, we had a bunch of swimmers here this summer and our first practice back, we had, you know, everybody walks in and they didn't have to wear masks. Now we're actually back in mask protocol um, since school started in the, in the fall and September, but this summer we didn't have mask protocol and we could have as many people in the lane as we wanted. And we did all of that. Right. And it was like, we had a real practice and there was so much energy in that first practice back and people were really excited to be together and like live somewhat normally. Um, but now that we, um, you know, we're in the fall and in the north, you know, COVID numbers are going up. Fortunately, on campus, they're staying very low. Um, but in the New Hampshire region, they're up higher than they ever have been. Um, you know, so our fingers are crossed that we don't have any outbreaks on campus and we don't get shut down or anything. But um, our team has been, you know, we've been able to train pretty normally and, and operate pretty normally. The only difference is, you know, you have your mask on right until you get in the water and you have it back on right until you get out of the water. Um, you know, so, um, it's been fun to be able to coach the whole team, um, you know, and it's been fun to be able to do it under more normal conditions. Who are some teams that you face in your conference on swim meet days? So far we competed against Brown, Princeton, Cornell, and Harvard. Of course, what is the recruitment process like for prospective student athletes looking to go into swimming? Well, oh God, that's such a loaded question. It could be so many. I mean, it's so different for so many types of recruits and types of people and what their process is and timelines and all of that. Um, you know, you've got so many different pathways of approaching the recruiting process. Um, and in the Ivy League, we have a slightly slower recruiting process than a lot of the a lot of the country does, especially from what I was used to in the Power Five. And the Power Five at this time of the year, high school juniors would have already been committed and done. You know, I mean, that's basically where that's at. Um, but in the Ivy League, we can't do admissions pre-reads until July after their junior year. So I don't even know right now if I could get any juniors into school. I wouldn't know. Um, you know, I wouldn't have an idea until I get a better idea of what their admissions pre-reads look like and what, what their academics look like after the end of their junior year with test scores and full, full grades of freshman, sophomore, and junior year of high school. Um, but from a perspective on, you know, recruiting, I think everyone's looking for so many different things. So it's really getting to know the recruit and really seeing if what you're looking for and what they want are a match. Um, you know, I think that your values have to match. I think your expectations have to match. Um, and that's really important to me and, and behavior. Um, I'm, a, I'm somebody that recruits, uh, potential and I recruit talent, but I recruit the right behavior type for what I'm looking for and the right values for the team I want to build and the right, you know, person who wants to follow the expectations I have for this program and how we operate going forward. So that will limit the recruiting pie quite significantly. You know, I'm pretty quick to, to, decrease the size of my recruiting list. Um, and, um, when I know somebody is the right fit for me, then I, you know, will go after them with everything I have and hope that they come to the school that I'm at, you know? And so, gosh, we have, um, 
14 student athletes, men and women total, who were verbally committed to Dartmouth for next fall and just extremely excited for them. Um, our process in the Ivy League is a little bit different. Um, you know, I can't say words like they're committed. I can say verbally committed, right? We don't know if they get into school until early decision, you know, comes out in December, but um, we have a pretty good idea. Um, and so just, you know, learning the, the process here and um, finding the right, right people for, for Dartmouth and for me and my program. Um, we're going to build something really special here. And I think the indication of the performance of our team over these last two weeks, it will show what that, what that's going to be. Um, so I'm pretty excited for next year's class to come in and join us and help us on our mission. What has it been like, obviously to take your time at Duke as a recruitment coordinator to now your time as a head coach recruiting and being the one that recruits? Well, and I actually was the one that recruited at Duke and I was the recruiting without the title, you know, I was the recruiting coordinator at Northwestern and at Minnesota. So everywhere I've been, I've actually been in charge of recruiting. Um, and now I'm doing it as a head coach. I'm not the recruiting coordinator anymore because I have so many other tasks that take up my time. Um, you know, one of my assistant coaches is our, um, our recruiting coordinator. His name's Daniel Graber and he organizes me. Um, I wish I could do more in recruiting than I am doing right now. I've just, it's amazing. Oh, awesome. I said this to, you know, a couple of my former head coaches. I just said, all of a sudden, one little thing derails my time for two hours. And I meant to do X, Y, and Z. And then I didn't make any of those recruiting calls because of this one thing that derailed my time. It's like pretty amazing how your role changes when you become the head coach. Um, so, you know, I basically recruited most of our class for fall 2022 by myself while I was here alone. Um, and then when my assistants got here, we recruited a couple more um, and then really focused on the, the high school 2023 class. Um, so it's been interesting to like let go of the coordinating of recruiting. Um, and I should probably be a better teacher than I am. I've just been so busy. Like year one as a new head coach has been crazy. Um, but um, you know, we'll, we will see how it goes. I still want to be very active in recruiting. Um, and we'll see how my role kind of shifts as we, as I get a little bit more experienced here at Dartmouth as a head coach. What advice would you give people looking to get into college coaching and especially year one head coaches like you? <laughs> so, well, if you're getting, if you want to get into college coaching, my advice is to um, have a contingency plan. <laughs> because, you know, you see a lot of coaching changes occur all the time, all the time in every sport. Um, so only do it if you love it. Like, I think you have to have the mind frame of we are educators and we are um, here to help people learn and grow through their four years of college, right? Um, I really think of myself strongly as an educator, but I also think of myself as really being challenging for people. Um, I want them to think on a different level. I want them to behave on a different level. I want them to have expectations they never knew that they could have. Um, you know, I think swimming for me is a pretty big challenge in a positive and fun way. I'm gonna help you grow and that will be uncomfortable sometimes, right? Um, but I, I look at myself as an educator, and I think that this occupation is about educating. I mean, we're getting people who are 18 years old coming into school. And, you know, if you think about what we do, I mean, these are, you know, young kids. They're not fully mature. And I mean that from a developmental standpoint, like your prefrontal cortex and your executive functioning aren't even finished developing until you're like 22 to 25. So you have people that you have to really help learn and grow and guide and help them figure their, you know, themselves out and help them through challenges. And so I think that you have to approach your, your career as a coach, as an educator. And so I think that um, we've gotten too far away um, from that model across the country in a lot of sports. Um, I think that it's become a lot about like wins and losses and all of that. And don't get me wrong, I am competitive, competitive and I want to win everything. But I think that there's a way to go about it um, that is on the education model that will help them long-term be better student athletes. So that would be my advice for somebody that wants to get into coaching in general. Um, as a new head coach, um, you know, for someone else who's a new head coach, I actually thought about contacting the College Swimming Coaches Association for our convention. And 
I even thought of a creative uh, title for a presentation, but um, it was taking the ass out of assistant. <laughs> and, um, you know, your role is going to shift uh, big time. And I think you have to be ready for that role to shift because being the head coach, everybody wants some of your time. The expectations of you were very different. Um, you know, I, I'm, it's not the same as when I was an assistant. So you just have to be ready for those changes, you know? Um, and I think you have to be ready to be really, really busy. Um, you know, you're going to be pulled in so many different directions nonstop. And so there's always going to be something. And so I think be, be prepared um, and be really good at managing your time and managing yourself and being able to recharge your mind and yourself. That's great advice. Where can my listeners find you on social media along with the Dark Myth Swimming Program app? Yeah, so my personal social media, um, it's at Coach Jesse Moore and Dark Myth is at Dark Myth Swim Dive. So you can find us on any platform, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, it's all the same for both my, my personal account and our Dartmouth account. Thank you again, Coach Jesse Moore, for your interview and best of luck in your future as you begin your career at Dartmouth as the head coach. Thanks, Brandon. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Facebook at Brandon Sports Talk, Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon. And you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Coach Jesse Moore, for your interview and best of luck in your future. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.